go. So I've cut a piece of twine to show you a strategy for um, truing up funnels that want to move canter off in one direction or another or another. The strategy for for one of the strategies for springs is to make certain that the funnel as it compresses it's doing so vertically. If the funnel has the opportunity to canter off in one direction or another, it's going to sit uh, it sits not going to be optimum because you're not going to gain all of the resistance that you typically would from the spring, especially since the central portion of the funnel is where the greatest amount of tension actually occurs. And uh, the risk is also over a period of time that the funnel will lop over to the degree that metal fatigue will form and the spring will actually break. So this is a way to be able to true that funnel up without completely tying a course of springs. Cut a piece of spring, I take my wax block, it's just a big chunk of, of beeswax. You can buy this from beekeepers, your Saturday market. It's always nice and it smells good. And you run your flax twine or hemp twine through it numerous times until the string comes up feeling very, very waxy. And you can tell it just mats everything down onto it. It doesn't want to open up very easily. The fiber stays very, very tight. You see Show that? me that again. I'm okay. Open yes. It up. Stays pretty much in position. These springs, these twines can become abraded very quickly. And so I'm going to create a just a, a hitch um, and attach and attach it to one of these lower rungs. This is a little bit of a cheat rather than having to tie a course of springs. I'm going to loop it over instead of creating a knot. Pull it through, you'll be able to see it. And it just slips right on through. Okay. Now, cinch it down. Another nice thing about the beeswax is it creates enough tension in the fiber that it can't slip off of itself. So it stays in position. It also keeps tension against the metal or the steel to where it can't slip around the orbit all that easily. It's going to be a little bit of a logistics problem since the camera is in the position that I would normally, I, a position I normally would be in. So I'm going to just modify this. So we're seeing it the way you see it. We're seeing it the way when you're, you're tying it. it. I'd see it. So you stay where you are with the camera, and I'm going to get a couple of tacks. These stainless steel nails are really great for for spring ups because the heads are large, and they can hold a knot beneath. beneath the head. You see that and you're one of those old-time upholsters that spits tacks, yes? I am, but these you don't want to spit. They're, they are pretty heavy, and so what we're going to do is just set them in. And they're not sterilized. And they're not sterilized. Now I'll explain in just a moment why the position of the the nail. It will actually become apparent in a moment. It allows the spring tension to spread. I'm going to loop my twine back upon itself so I can use it as a fulcrum. And it will simply make the spring pull toward the nail. So you're not on the very bottom spring, you're on this like the second spring up. I'm the second I, loop I'm up. I'm on the third rung up. Okay. But it's kind of arbitrary. It depends upon where your best leverage is. There's rung I one, see. rung two, rung three. Okay. Now Watch what happens when I pull. I can influence the direction 
the funnel moves. You say, uh-oh, if I overcorrect, then I'm actually going the opposite direction. I want to pull it the other way. But those, those directions can be corrected by going in the opposite direction with twine or tying, simply tying a course lower down upon the rungs. Now there is a downside to using this method, especially if you're crossing over numerous funnels and you're not actually anchoring your tie to all of the funnels. And that is that as the spring collapses, it can abrade the twine and actually cause it to break. It can also make the spring function in such a way as it, as it hits the twine, especially if it's thick. It can keep the spring from, from compressing completely, and so it changes the way the piece sets. But this is a, a fast and efficient way of creating, on, especially on these copper alloy springs, a relatively vertical um, uh, compression of the funnel. It is almost impossible on this type of a tie to make these funnels completely vertical. It's quite difficult because the springs have obviously been used before. They, they do have been under tension. You can see that they want to go in various directions. You can stretch them out and make them uh, relatively true, but um, there are some limitations. I do test the springs prior to putting them in to make sure that they collapse properly, that they're not fatigued to the point of breaking. I like to reuse these springs, if at all possible, because the springs that are made today feel different. The, the just they're much more. Um, they tend to be harder, and they tend to not um, allow for a nice. Um, well, they tend they tend to inhibit contour. Seat. They tend to be so you talk, you've talked to me about them sitting differently, they, that old time springs sat differently. Older springs can sit a little differently. Mm -hmm. The gauge feels just a little different. These are much more malleable um, and it's a very difficult thing to describe. It's, it's more of a visceral thing that you'd have to actually get in and sit down on one. You'd have to practice tying springs in order to, to understand how that works. Now that said, this is not to oppose modern springs. Modern springs are still quite quite good and uh, you can get, obtain a very good seat with them. I do have to perform new construction now and then on historic objects where the springs just can't be reused. Or they're gone. Yeah, or they're gone. Yeah. And they can, seats can be recreated to feel like originals, but there are certain strategies that I won't go into today that have to be employed in order to obtain the, the, the same sit that you would have gotten from a copper alloy spring.